When we look at mammalian cells, you'll find that there's a number of different membranes associated with these cells that separate out one compartment from another. As an example, if we take a cell, there's going to be a membrane that separates out the external environment of the cell, known as the extracellular fluid, from the internal environment of the cell, known as the intracellular fluid. And this membrane is known as the cell membrane, also called the plasma membrane. But there's also other membranes inside of the cell separating out other compartments. So for example, when we take the nucleus, which houses our chromosomes and our DNA, our genetic material, it, there's a membrane that separates the internal environment from the, its external environment, which is the cytoplasm of the cell. And again, this is a membrane known as the nuclear membrane or nuclear envelope. There's also membranes for the mitochondria, membranes for the rough endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and also the Golgi apparatus. And we'll talk about those separate structures in subsequent videos. In this video, I wanna focus predominantly on the plasma membrane, which is the membrane separating out the extracellular from the intracellular compartments, and talk about what it's comprised of and what its job is, basically. So the first thing you need to know is this, that this plasma membrane is made up predominantly of two things. One, lipids, and two, proteins. In actual fact, the plasma membrane is made up of pretty much 50-50 lipids and proteins, okay? So let's first focus on the lipids. Now, lipids are basically fat-soluble substances. Often it's synonymous with fat, but they're fat-soluble substances. And the two major types of lipids that you're going to find that create this plasma membrane will be one, phospholipids, and two, cholesterol. <clears throat> now, let's first take the phospholipids. The phospholipids are what create the majority of this structure. The phospholipids are actually comprised in a bilayer. So there's actually two layers of phospholipids, one on top of the other. Now, how do they look? Well, phospholipids have a head to them and they also have a tail. In actual fact, they have two tails. And this phospholipid has a phosphate head and a fatty or two fatty acid tails. Now this phosphate head has a charge to it and actually really likes being in contact with water, which means it's hydrophilic. And the fatty acid tail being fats hate water and therefore they're termed hydrophobic. So you've got one end of this that likes water, the other end that doesn't like water, and there's gonna be two layers of these. Now if this is what makes up the plasma membrane, how do you think it's gonna arrange itself? There's predominantly water outside the cell, there's predominantly water inside the cell, and we're gonna have two layers of these phospholipids. How do you think they'll arrange themselves if the head likes water, the tail hates water? Well, it makes sense that they'll arrange themselves so that that phosphate head will be in contact with the water, which means it'll be facing the outside of the cell and it will be facing the inside of the cell. And this is how the phospholipid bilayer, which is what it's called, is arranged. And it's actually arranged like this all the way around the cell. Okay, so can you picture that phospholipid bilayer all the way around the cell. Now this is important because while the phosphate head has a charge and likes water, it's happy to come in contact with water soluble substances such as ions for example. But the fatty acid tail does not like water or water soluble substances such as ions and therefore repels them. So this means that this plasma membrane is semi-permeable and will let some things through and other things not through. That's the first point. Now, I said that this phospholipid bilayer made up of lipids, one phospholipids, here they are, two cholesterol, and cholesterol because it has this sort of fatty nucleus to it or a steroid based nucleus I, I should say, it embeds itself in this phospholipid bilayer 
And what the cholesterol does as it embeds itself is it actually changes the fluidity of the membrane. So you may think of this phospholipid bilayer as being a very solid structure, quite rigid, but in actual fact it's not. It's quite an elastic, flexible structure and is also known as being having a fluid mosaic structure to it, which means it is quite fluid and its fluidity is predominantly due to the concentration of cholesterol. So they're the two types of lipids that comprise this membrane, but what about the proteins? I said proteins are about 50%. Well, there's different types of proteins embedded in the phospholipid membrane. Now, first type, well, what you'll find first of all is that the proteins are predominantly glycoproteins which means they're proteins attached to a sugar. Let, I'm gonna write this down. Now this isn't one of the two types, but let's just write down glycoprotein so you can see it written. Now you know that carbohydrates are sugars, complex sugars coming together, and that glucose is that sugar, and so glyco is representing the sugar. So glycoprotein means sugar protein, which means it's a protein with a carbohydrate end to it. So make sure you keep that in mind because we're going to come back to that. Now the two types of proteins you're going to find are proteins that are embedded throughout the entire length, I shouldn't say length, width of the plasma membrane and proteins that simply just sit on the edge or the end of the plasma membrane. So the proteins that sit all the way through the plasma membrane, so they go from one end to another, so proteins that go from one end to another and span that entire width of the membrane are called integral proteins. But you're going to also have proteins which sit just on the very end and I'm going to draw one that sits just on the very end of this protein like that and that's called a peripheral protein. So what's the difference? Why do we have peripheral proteins? Why do we have integral proteins? All right, let's take it over here. Integral proteins, first of all, because they span that entire width of the plasma membrane, it means it allows for some sort of communication from the external environment to occur with the internal environment and vice versa. So this is important because remember I said it's a semi-permeable membrane. Only let some things in and other things in. How does, it, how does it determine what it can let in and what it can't let in? That's a good question. Well, here's the rule of thumb that you should remember for a phospholipid bilayer. It will not, it will not let through, where am I gonna write this? Up here. It will not let through anything that is large or charged. That's the rule of thumb when it comes to the semi-permeable phospholipid bilayer of the cell. It won't let through anything large or charged. Now, let's think of ions, so charged atoms or elements. They're atoms and elements, so they're small, right? So they're not large at all, so you may think they can get through, but ions, by definition, are charged, so they cannot get through. Now, sometimes we do want ions to get through, and the way that they can get through are through these integral proteins. So integral proteins can act as channels. They can act as channels, allowing substances that can't usually get through to get through. Okay, so predominantly water-soluble substances. But they can also act, so they can act as channels, but they can also act as receptors. So sometimes you're going to have a hormone, for example, a water-soluble hormone, which, because it's water-soluble, cannot get through this membrane, but it needs to tell the inside of the cell to do something. So how does a hormone that's outside the cell tell the inside of the cell to do something? Well, it will bind to an integral protein, or it can bind to a peripheral protein, and it allows for changes to occur inside the cell, okay? So receptor activity. So it plays a role as a channel, plays a role as a receptor. Integral proteins can also play a role for transport. 
<coughs> sometimes there's substances that need to go from outside in, but they don't go down their concentration gradient. So remember the diffusion video where substances need to go from a high gradient to a low, and that's just how it works. That's just a physical law. It makes sense. If you've got the example I used in the lecture was if you've got a group of 15 people all blindfolded and grouped together, and you said, okay, three, two, one, go, and told them to walk in the direction they're facing, and if they hit an object, they bounce off in the opposite direction, what you'll find is after a couple of minutes, and you say, stop, you tell them to take their blindfold off, they'll be approximately randomly distributed compared to their colleagues or peers. Now, they didn't do it on purpose, it just happened because it's a random distribution. But what they did do was they moved from the area of high concentration to the area of low concentration. And that's diffusion, that's just a natural process. And so when I said before that integral proteins play a role as a channel to allow things from outside in, that's usually down a concentration gradient. So if one of these channels of proteins open up, for sodium, we know sodium ions are predominantly high concentration outside, it's gonna diffuse inside. Now the difference between the transport function of integral proteins is that they can take substances that are in their low concentration gradient outside and throw them in to where they're at a high concentration gradient. You may be thinking, how does that happen? Well, it must use energy in the form of ATP to do this, okay? So that's called primary active transport. Or it can use the energy from another concentration gradient, which is secondary active transport. But don't get caught up on that in this video. I'll talk about primary, secondary active transport in another video. But these are the major functions of the integral proteins. The channels, receptors, transport. What about the peripheral proteins? Well, again, they will play a role in transport as well. Peripheral proteins you know, play a role as receptors, true, and transport. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the fact that I brought up glycoproteins before. I said a lot of these proteins actually have a sugar or a carbohydrate attached to it. Now, where's this sugar or carbohydrate attached? It's actually attached to the very end. So you're going to find that there's going to be these sugar molecules attached to the ends of these proteins on the outside of the cell, which means if you actually have a look at it, if 50% of this plasma membrane of proteins, and they're predominantly glycoproteins, this plasma membrane on the outside is gonna be covered by these sugar moieties, just sort of dangling off the edge like this fuzzy sort of border. That's important, and that's called the glycocalyx. So the glycoproteins that form the outside of the cell is called the glycocalyx. And why is the glycocalyx important? Why do cells have these sugar moieties that sit on the outside of the cell? All right, we're gonna have to make some room here. The reason why that's the case is that again, you've got all these sugar moieties on the outside of the cell, term the glycocalyx. And it plays a couple of different roles. So one role that the glycocalyx plays is that it allows one glycoprotein or a number of glycoproteins can actually communicate with the glycoproteins of another cell and allow for cell-to-cell -cell interaction. Cell-to-cell -cell interaction. That's one mechanism. The other thing is that they can be used as receptors. As an example, insulin binds to the sugar moiety of a glycoprotein and tells information that goes from the attachment of the sugar moiety through the protein and tells the inside of the cell to do something. So it's communication. So as a receptors, and like I said, an example is insulin. And another role that these glycoproteins play is actually they play a very important role in immune function. And this is something we'll talk about in a future lecture. Immune function actually plays a role in recognizing whether the cell or foreign um, uh, particles belong to self, meaning 
Should this be in the body or should this not be in the body? Recognition. And this recognition is part of the immune system. So this is basically the phospholipid bilayer, the membrane that separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. It's made up of phospholipids, cholesterols, integral proteins, peripheral proteins, and a lot of these proteins are glycoproteins, which forms this coating of sugar on the outside of the cell called the glycocalyx, which plays many different roles.